Lord, we have many other needs in each of our lives uh, that you know and you care about so deeply. And we pray that you'd answer them and be present in our lives um, to strengthen us and to, um, to lift us up. And we pray this all for your glory. In Jesus' name. Please uh, stand and join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And please stay standing while we're going to confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Or, that's right, thank you. Nicene Creed, because it's Communion Sunday. <laughs> I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated and uh, invite the ushers forward to collect our offerings.
dear God, we thank you for the many good things we enjoy in life and all that's been provided to us. We offer these gifts to you for your kingdom, for the spread of the gospel of Christ, and to help our neighbor in need. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated, and I'll invite, invite the worship team to lead us in music. Well, let's continue uh, in song, worshiping our Lord. We have just one song today, maybe a little bit longer, a prayer medley. Um, I didn't know quite what to title it. Maybe I should have called it Living by Prayer Medley. Um, and we will continue with this. Let's worship the Lord.
pray while pastors have that. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you call us to come, come to you, bring our needs, bring our cares. We cast them all upon you. What a privilege to be able to come into your house and even do that corporately as we just did a, a few minutes ago. Uh, thank you that you always answer, Lord. And just be with Pastor now as he brings us your message. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Chris. So today we're looking at prayer and what does it mean? What's the, what's the role of prayer in your life? And we're going to be looking at two primary things. One is how prayer is essential to your relationship with God. And the other is how prayer is essential to how God uses you as his instrument of grace in the world. And uh, these true truths are demonstrated in our, our scriptures today, both Jeremiah 29 and James 5. So I'm, I'm doing a little different thing. I'm actually, I'm, I'm using both of those texts in the, for the sermon today instead of just one here. Uh, but they both have such good applications. I felt I, I needed to bring them both. So, so we'll start with Jer Jeremiah 29, 11. And of course, that, that's a favorite verse during graduation seasons, right? You know, that, uh, that verse, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. We like to declare that to us, uh, for the, those graduates looking out at their bright future. But uh, those words feel a little different when, when you realize they were spoken to Jews starting their exile. I mean, do, I'm trying to compare it. That would be like, you know, someone, a prisoner in a, you know, in a jumpsuit and handcuffs who's walking away, going to their life sentence, <laughs> uh, to going to a life sentence in prison and then telling, declaring over them, you know, the Lord knows his plans over you, plans for welfare and your peace. I'm sure that person at that point in life would be, look back at you kind of strangely, like, really? For, for real? Uh, you, you're talking to me? <laughs> and I imagine the, the Jews le heading out in the exile in their first years of exile would have felt that same way. Now, Jeremiah had warned them. I mean, this all happened as foretold. Jeremiah had warned them that Babylon would conquer Israel as punishment for their sins against God and that they would be exiled in Babylon for 70 years. And the conquest happened as foretold. The exile had begun, and we're about eight years into the exile when we get to chapter 29. And it says that, that some, previously it says some false prophets had started telling the exiles that, hey, it's just, just two years. Babylon's going to be overthrown and we're all going home. Great news. And Babylon, and Jeremiah's got a right to this. No, no, God said 70 years. So he's, he writes chapter 29. He writes a letter to the exiles telling them not to listen to these false prophets, to this false hope. Because everything God had foretold had happened and would happen, and his plan of 70 years was not going to change. But he was going to bring good out of it. And so we're going to read chapter uh, Jeremiah 29 here, uh, 1 through 14. And, uh, uh, oh, sorry, you guys clicked through it, because <laughs> it's a lot. I'll read through it. Here we go. Um, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of, El of Elisah, the son of Shaphan, and Gamariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf 
for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come to me and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. God has a good future for us. That is the, the central truth of that, of that chapter. And so if you're trusted in that truth, you're trusting that, the truth there, and therefore you're trusting God and his plan, you're going to pray to him because you're going to want to know his will. You're going to want to know it. Are you staying in his plan? Are you remaining in it? And so you'll seek him with all your heart. So this means a regular way of life, a prayer as a continual thing in your life. So continually seek God. And he promises he will hear you. You will find God when you seek him with all your heart. And God is working, he says, he's working all things towards restoration. Now while the Jews waited for God's plan to unfold, God instructed them to steadfastly be his people so that they were in a pagan land uh, surrounded by a culture hostile to their faith and god told them build homes plant gardens have families be a community of god's people where god has planted you and he also told them seek the welfare of the pagan city around you pray for them with your, with, you know, seek their welfare with your actions and resources, pray for them. So he says our prayers, that, that's the, the, that regular way of life, are, we're also to intercede for the city around us. And our prayers are to draw us near to God so we know his will. Now as followers of Christ, we have a lot in common with these exiles. The Jews were exiles in Babylon, but they lived as God's people. They didn't become Babylonians. They lived as God's people. And they looked forward. They kept that their hope and that return to their true home. And the scripture tells us that the Christian's true home is the new heavens and new earth that will come when God restores all creation. Second Peter 3.13 says, But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. The Bible tells us that Jesus died to set us free from sin's power so we can be citizens of his righteous kingdom. We are exiles on earth right now. So therefore, we should live according to the righteousness of Jesus' kingdom and not according to the world we find around us. Romans 6, 22 says... But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. God also promised his people that that they will find him when they seek him with all his heart. And we have a similar promise from Jesus to his disciples in Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. The exiles were reassured that God was working all things toward good in his timeline. 
And Romans 8, 28 tells us, we know that for the, those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And I find a lot of reassurance in these verses. Uh, because if you're around my age, and definitely if you're younger than my age, then you've never experienced living in a, in a Christian majority in any part of our culture. Um, you, you've always felt like a religious minority, except, well, except maybe when we gather here right now, right? But elsewhere, anywhere else in the world, you, you feel like a religious majority. There's pressure from all these different places to be less Christian. And the world around us views Christian morality as archaic and restrictive or odd, <laughs> to say the least, even while it enjoys the prosperity and liberty built upon Christian teaching. And so the question is, you know, what do we do? What are we to do when we are just surrounded by a godless culture? And we, I, we look at that example in Scripture for those people in that time, still applies to us today. It says, build homes, plant gardens, have families. Seek the welfare of your city, whichever city that is. Call upon God, seek him, be his people be his representatives of peace in that city. Live according to God's righteousness. So that pattern, that's, that's to be our continual way of life, whatever, wherever we find ourselves. And then we're also reminded in, by this example here that our hope is not in earthly kingdoms or in who is in power. These false prophets told the Jews, hey, hey, just two years, Babylon's going to be overthrown, a change of power. But God said that his, his plan was going to be a lot longer than two years. It was going to be 70 years. Now today, we're not told the timeline of our situation. So things might get much worse before they ever get better. You, you might not live to see the better days that we hope for. They, but they might not come until your grandchildren's time or later. But we hold to God's word and his promise and his testimony that he will restore all things. He's working all things towards his restoration. But in the meantime, he is shaping us to be the instruments, to be his instruments for his plan. He's shaping his people to be instruments of his plan so that we can continue steadfast in prayer, seeking him so we can be the instruments he wants in this time. And we look at the example of the Jews. God shaped them through 70 years of exile. And in that, they learned to continually seek him in prayer. And what that developed in them was a, just a con confident contentment in God that didn't waver under trials. Because we see in their history, for hundreds of years after the exodus, or after the, the exile, that they never again fell into idolatry, never worshipped pagan gods, they never committed the abominations that sent them into exile in the first place. So God used this experience to develop a, a steadfastness in the whole people there. And God wants to form steadfastness in you, too, in us, his people. And we have this example then from James chapter 5, 7 through 11. It says, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also, be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So we know God has a good plan for us. And so in response to that truth, we, we trust God and we trust his plan. We show that trust with that faith. We show it 
We exercise it through prayer and through faithful obedience to God. And then rest of, the rest of James here, this is our, our next part here. Oop, I jumped ahead. Um, start in verse 13. This tells us, this is our instruction here. For how do we pray for each other? How do Christians pray for one another in our community? This is there, this is the, the person, the book earlier was kind of the group large picture this is the narrow picture how do you pray for your neighbor so it says verse 13 is anyone among you suffering let him pray is anyone cheerful let him sing praise is anyone among you sick let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the lord and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the lord will raise him up if he has committed sins he will be forgiven Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again. And heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers... If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So we see from these verses that prayer is more than sentiment, more than nice thoughts. It is a lifeline to and from God. So when you are suffering, pray. You will find God and be comforted. And if you are blessed and you're cheerful, we'll give God thanks for that. In both cases, this will keep your soul steadfast in God. It says, if you are sick, call for the elders to visit you. And I have to ask, do we, do we follow this? When you are sick, do you ask for a prayer visit? And I'll start by saying, we're, we're very glad to do this. Uh, but it's a lot harder to do if we have to be detectives and figure out if people are sick. However, I, I want to put most of this on me. Any change that needs to happen, I, want to, I, really, I feel like i got to put that on me because I know I have not consistently done this as written. And, and yes, I can say, well, okay, hey, I've called people when they're sick, I've prayed for them. Sometimes I've, I've visited them to pray in person, but I haven't consistently done this for you or all of you. Um, so if I have overlooked you or neglected you ever, I, I apologize if I've missed that. And, and I'm going to start the change. <laughs> and I'm going to, as much as it's possible, I'm, I'm going to arrange to visit and pray for you, um, if, you if you're willing. <laughs> but I recognize some people will just say, no, no, don't ever. Uh, and I'm not going to force that, obviously. But, but I'm going to try to make that as much as possible to visit you and pray for you when you need it. So, but the, I also want to point out, this does say elders, plural. Uh, it doesn't say the pastor shall do this all by himself and only him. <laughs> it's, uh, it means it's not on me alone to do this. Uh, I should be doing this with elders, with the mature leaders of the church. Uh, so, council members, uh, you can expect occasionally I will invite you and ask you to join me in visiting our members to pray for them. Uh, this verse also tells us to apply oil um, and there's very good reasons to understand this as medical application i'm not going to explain those all right here you can ask me later why that is um, but there this is the medical application of oil and so from this we learn god cares about your spiritual and your physical condition so we should also care about both uh, but when it comes to the application hey, we, we we have wonderful doctors and hospitals and nurses today so we you know they apply the medicine and believers apply the prayers um, we also see in these verses god heals in response to the prayer of faith now, the prayer of faith that means tr faith in god sincerely trusting god to heal when and how he chooses that he can and he's able to but we're going to trust him and his timing and we we know hey we some things won't be healed until we reach heaven. But still, we, we, we will pray for whatever healing and comfort God is willing to give. 
And God also, he adds to this promise. He, he says in response to the prayer of faith, your sins will be forgiven. Um, and this is a great relief. Because often when we're suffering, we remember the sins we have not repented of. And these sins are a barrier in our relationship with God, a barrier in our prayers. We are hesitant to pray them because we doubt, we have doubt now about our relationship with God because we, we feel that truth that our, our sins have offended God. And so we might even wonder, if, if my, is, is my suffering, is my sickness punishment for my sins? So believers, we, we can comfort each other with the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. When someone is sincerely, sincerely concerned about their sins, and you can share the gospel news that Jesus Christ has taken away their sins, and their sins are forgiven, and they can receive this by faith in Jesus. We can declare, you can declare to one another, your sins are forgiven for Jesus' sake. Scripture declares it, therefore, you can share that blessed assurance of the forgiveness of sin. Now, since the prayer of faith is powerful to heal and powerful to forgive, verse 16 says, confess your sins to one another. Uh, now, this should be done wisely. You don't just confess this to any random person. You should, it's, you should find a mature believer you can trust with those things. But, and which may be hard to do. <laughs> that, might, that might be hard to do. Um, but we should not neglect this practice. Ask other believers to pray for both your physical and your spiritual healing. And it, this, the example we're seeing here is, is examples of praying in person. It's calling us to pray in person for each other. And I think we see, you know, what part of this is because... Yes, it is good to know that someone else is praying for you from their home, and we should do that. But it is so comforting to someone when you pray for them in person. And God tells us in the next verse that the prayer of a righteous person is effective as it fervently works. And to illustrate this truth, he reminds us of Elijah. The, the Elijah, he was a guy with a nature just like us. Nothing special about him. Uh, and in fact, he seems to be a lot more rowdy <laughs> than most of us are. <laughs> and, um, but by prayer, he learned God's will. By prayer, he brought a drought. And by prayer, he brought back the rain. Prayer is powerful. And so James then closes with a final truth about how urgent, how important this is. He says, if someone among us is not walking according to the truth God has revealed to us, you should pray and intervene. If God brings them back, you have saved a soul from death and covered a multitude of sins. So this, that's an awesome reality. And it, it, and it teaches us to take seriously our role in the spiritual life of one another, which, which is so contrary to the world around us that is just you do you i'm not going to bother i'm not going to bother you if we disagree i'm not going to bother you because uh, you just you do you and this is no no you th there are spiritual consequences to everyone to everyone's actions and choices so if you care about them you will intervene and you will pray and you will speak up and god wants to use you he wants to use you as a conduit of his grace and power he wants to use you as his instrument through which he can pour the grace of Jesus Christ into another person. So we pray because prayer is powerful to heal and to forgive and even to save a soul from death. So all this has taught us about, what has this all said to us about prayer? We pray by faith in God's promises. Those who sincerely seek him will find him. We pray regularly as a way of life because God it builds a steadfast relationship with us with, by prayer. We pray for the welfare of the world around us because God has sent us to be in his ambassadors of his peace. And we pray for each other because God acts on your prayers to heal and forgive. Your prayers are powerful because of the God that we pray to. And prayer 
is not a burdensome obligation. It is a joyful opportunity to meet with God and to join him in his work. Amen. With that, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word to us here in these examples from the past and from scripture that uh, teach all of us how we pray together uh, as, as your people and what you do among us as your people and also how you would have us pray for one another and just the, the power of prayer to change our lives and to change the world uh, because it calls upon you. And I pray that you would just sink these truths into our hearts um, so that we would be people of prayer um, and that we practice what these verses say. I pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. And so we're going to... Uh, pray or we're going to sing our hymn now uh, which is you'll see in the uh, oh, it's oh, oh, 4,000 tons to sing and so that's uh, a very appropriate hymn here today for communion, and uh, so while I'm uh, reading the exhortation, I'll invite uh, Al to come up and prepare the elements. Um, so this is for us as we prepare our hearts. So dear friends in Christ, in order that you may receive this holy sacrament in a worthy manner, you should carefully consider what you must now believe and do. From the words of Christ, this is my body which is given for you, this is my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins, you should believe that Jesus Christ is present with his body and blood as the words declare. And from Christ's words, for the remission of sins, you should also believe that Jesus gives to you his body and blood to strengthen your assurance that your sins are forgiven. And finally, you should do as Christ commands you when he says, take, eat, drink of it, all of you, this do in remembrance of me. If you believe these words of Christ and do as he has commanded, then you have properly examined yourselves and may eat Christ's body and drink his blood in a worthy manner. And you should also unite in giving thanks to Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for so great a gift, and should love one another from a pure heart. And thus, with the whole Christian church, have comfort and joy in Jesus Christ our Lord. To this end, may God the Father give you his grace 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. On the night in which our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he blessed it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, and when they had eaten and given thanks, he blessed it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, drink, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so the ushers are going to bring you uh, forward to the altar to receive communion. Uh, the bread has a cup in the middle if you want a gluten-free wafer. Um, and so just signify that and we'll give you a cup. There's a stack of them. And, that, and then for the juice, the inner circle is juice, the outer circle is wine. So when that's presented to you, you take the cup from whichever you want there. So, all right, I'll ask the ushers to bring you forward.
please kneel as you are able. crucified and risen Lord, Jesus Christ, who has now bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Peace be with you. kneel as you are able. crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who has now bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Peace be with you. Amen. crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who has now bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith.
to life everlasting. Peace be with you. Amen. crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who has now bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Peace be with you. Receive the benediction from Numbers 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Have a great day, and please join us for a coffee and fellowship afterwards. So.